This is Selma Schimmel in Chicago at the annual ASCO meeting, and now we are going to do another segment for our Advocacy in Action series as we present an advocate in action, Linda House, oncology nurse and executive vice president of external affairs for the cancer support community. Hello, Hi, Selma. Linda. Hello, how are you? It's great to see you sitting across from me. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, we've worked together for so many years, and now you're involved in new initiatives that we want to learn all about in regards to the mission and the focus of the cancer support community and how the cancer support community is beneficial to patients and what patients need to know to get the support they need. Mm -hmm. So as you know, our organization has a pretty um, powerful mission statement, and that is to ensure that no one faces cancer alone. And we do that through three core components. Um, one is to empower through education, one is to um, strengthen through action, and the third component of that is to sustain through community. The wellness community was founded 30 years ago this year, so that's a big anniversary for those on the West Coast in California by Dr. Harold Benjamin. And Gilda Radner, um, and it's published in her book, um, sought care and participated in the wellness communities in California. And then it was after Gilda Radner passed that Gilda's Club was founded on the East Coast. She always wanted to have a wellness community on the East Coast, and so Gilda's Club was formed. And then two years ago, those two organizations, because their missions were so similar. The care model of patient empowerment and patient active concept were so closely tied that the organizations merged and became the cancer support community. Explain please some of the various means of support and the diversity of projects and um, opportunities that mm -hmm. the organization presents for patients and their loved ones. We are still anchored in psychosocial support and education. We do direct patient services in 56 affiliates around the world. Most of those are here in the United States. So we do educational programming, we do workshops, we do Tai Chi, anything that would, would imply a, 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 an active role of the patient. You know, we don't do things like massage, which is more of a passive role for the patient. Um, we also have a research and training in Institute. So not only are we delivering direct patient care, but we're also doing research to understand really what the needs of the patients are around that patient journey and how we can deliver care even better. And then the third component to what we do is public policy. So how do we work with members of Capitol Hill to ensure that no one faces cancer alone? The cancer support community is also involved in, in programs for healthcare professionals. Yes, absolutely. And especially with the work of our Research and Training Institute and the learnings that we have there through our um, breast cancer registry and our thought leader summits, we widely share and publish those throughout the professional community. Wherever a patient is in the world, all they need to do is go to the Cancer Support Community website. Correct. It is www.cancersupportcommunity.org and there's a full list of the affiliates. They can join an online support group, and you know studies show that patients do as well with an online support group as they do with a face-to-face -face support group. They're more than welcome to to join there. One of the programs that we just launched in the last couple of weeks is very exciting. It's called Open to Options and it is delivered either in our centers or through our telephone hotline. And it's really a service where patients can call if they're facing a decision, a cancer care decision. So it might be a newly diagnosed patient who wants to talk about their frontline options. It might be a newly re-diagnosed patient who wants to talk about um, an option that's being given to them. And the whole intent of that is to prepare the patient for the conversation with the healthcare professional. So we will work through them, through with them, what their, their goals of therapy might be, what the goals for their lives might be, what their concerns are, and they will walk away with a customized list of questions to take to their physician. It's almost the patient really designing the agenda for the meeting and taking control of that meeting um, and feeling like they're, they're walking away with a, a good decision. That's fabulous empowerment. It's, it's wonderful empowerment, and we, we did a pilot study on this with um, funds through an act and the, the Centers for Disease Control. And what we found in that pilot study was that patients not only were more satisfied with the conversation um, with their healthcare team, but 50% of those patients spoke with their healthcare team about clinical trials. 9% of them enrolled on clinical trials, and there was a higher, and this is most, as an oncology nurse, this is most important to me, there was a higher, or I'm sorry, a, a less amount of decisional regret. 
So people were more confident in the decisions that they made following those interventions. Well, 9% increase in clinical trials is greater than the national statistic of patients involved in clinical trials. Right, so by three that's times. Significant. Yes. <laughs> it's very significant. Yeah, but just from a patient angst perspective, too, that decrease in decisional regret is pretty, pretty powerful as well. Very powerful. Yeah. And I can validate that as yeah. a survivor. Unfortunately, yes. Linda House, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Oncology Nurse and Executive Vice President of External Affairs for the Cancer Support Community. Thank you.